The devil would never come to you with horns and black looks. The devil will always come in form of a nice looking young man or woman, smiling and so friendly, just so you can buy into what is about to offer you. This is a true life story of a young man, a young content creator who moved to Los Angeles for greener pasture and how he almost fell into the trap of Satan. Watch this. This story is the reason I stopped making content for five years. You guys remember when all those fine stars and skit Instagrammers moved to LA in like 2015-ish? So I wasn't a huge creator at the time, but I was there and around it all as all of that stuff was happening. I moved from Chicago to LA three weeks after high school with like $2,000 in my pocket that I saved up working at Steak and Shake with this other aspiring creator named David. I was much more into editing and being behind the camera at that time, and he was much more into Vine and vlogs and being on camera. That time of our lives was absolutely crazy. Everybody was broke, posting anything we could onto YouTube to get some attention. I happened to get a spot at the now notorious 1600 Vine Apartments, and David got a spot a little bit closer to USC. Everyone was collaborating with everyone, and it was the era of clickbait YouTube. And to be honest, it was extremely fun for the first few months, until Hollywood started to notice that influencers were the next big thing, and that the landscape of the industry was changing. And we started to get invited to more exclusive parties and events, where it seemed as if old Hollywood was almost grooming new Hollywood. And there was rumors of this one gathering that was happening on a monthly basis, where it seemed like anybody that got invited saw a massive jump in their numbers, secured huge brand deals right after attending. But apparently this gathering worked on a buddy system. Someone had to vouch for you and bring you as a guest. And by blind luck, me and David ended up getting invited. Some talent agent saw me and David shoot a silly skit at a random party. He didn't invite us that second. He just told us that he saw something special in us and took our contact information. And listen, people do that all the time in LA, but this guy had a different feel to him. He wasn't trying to convince us he had connections or hype himself up like everybody else does. He was just super calm and had a sharp way of speaking that demanded respect. He was extremely brief and after getting our numbers, he just said look out for the invite and walked away. And this is where it gets weird. I never gave this guy my address, I only gave him my number. But I ended up getting an invitation by letter. And at the time, I thought that that was so cool. But in retrospect, as an adult looking back at it, that alone was a huge violation of privacy and a major red flag. But at the time, when I tell you I was absolutely buzzing with excitement. When I got it, the letter was so extravagant and detailed. It was gold with black and red lettering that read something like, your talents have been noted, your name has been endorsed. And I'll never forget this part. The dreams you have been chasing are a night away through the seventh heaven. And the address was a beautiful home in Laurel Canyon that was set to happen that weekend. It also noted to not be a minute late and not to expect to leave before midnight. And at the time, it felt like the Willy Wonka golden ticket. And the excitement doubled when I got a text from David at the same time, in all caps saying, did you get one too? I felt like our lives were about to change. And I was right. David blew up after this party and I had to go into hiding. And I was right. David blew up after this party and I had to go into hiding. When I tell you I was on cloud nine leading up to that party, I mean, I was so young and naive and delusionally optimistic. I truly believed that I was going to go to this party and leave rich because it literally seemed like that was happening to the creators around me that attended. I was hyped. I've never been a braggy person, but when you're young and excited, you get consumed by good news and want to talk to your friends and peers about it. So everybody that I chatted with who I knew was a content creator and was in the know about this party, I couldn't help but to tell them. And all the feedback was positive and along the lines of, let me know how it goes, or can you try to get me into the next one? And even some from bigger creators saying, I'll see you there with like a little smirk on their face like they were pumped for me. Except for one conversation with a creator that most of you probably know. This creator is an extremely positive guy and he's one of the most wholesome, bubbly, genuine guys I met out there. And when I told him the good news, he looked at me like I told him a tsunami was headed towards the building. The usual joy that this man brought to every conversation turned into real fear and concern. And he made me leave the lobby and come up to his apartment before explaining anything to me. Like he was scared that somebody was going to overhear our conversation. When we got up to his apartment, he was just pacing. Like he had no idea how to start this conversation. But when he finally spoke up, all he said was, listen, Doug, I know you're excited, but I'm begging you, please do not go. That man is not who you think he is. He was being so frantic and I could see tears welling up in this guy's eyes, but I was young and I thought that I knew everything. I didn't even think the talent agent that sent us the invite was important. I was interested in the connections and I didn't really care if the talent agent was shady or if his intention was to sign me to a bad deal. I thought I'd just say no to any bad contract that he tried to send me, but still get to reap all the benefits of the party. So I tried to pry a little bit and ask follow-up questions, but all he gave me was, I have a friend who went and he hasn't been the same since he didn't cooperate. I don't know what he saw or what they did to him, but Doug, I do not want to see that happen to you. I start reassuring him that they won't make me do anything that I don't want to do. I don't even drink, let alone take any party favors. So peer pressure isn't much of an issue for me. I make up a lie to get out of the situation because to be honest, I selfishly wanted to stay excited about this party and I really didn't want to hear anything negative about it. So I jokingly told him that I texted him when I got home and that I had to leave to edit some videos tonight. What I was really doing was calling my dad to beg him for a hundred dollars to buy a rental suit. Mind you, we were all still poor and I was living in an apartment that I could barely afford. My dad reluctantly sent me the money and I immediately texted David to pick me up tomorrow at 5 p.m. so we could 
both get our suits before the party and grab food before we head to the party at 11. When David picked me up the next day, he was so excited and in such a great mood that I had to hide my concerns from him, at least while we were shopping for the rental suits. I had to manufacture excitement because David always has his camera out and I wouldn't just be spoiling the mood, I would be ruining the content that he was trying to record. So I went along with it throughout the shopping process. Our plan was to drop his car off at my apartment, walk to the In-N-Out Burger on Sunset Boulevard, eat and then change into our suits in the bathroom and hop into the Uber so we didn't smell like burgers. When we finally sat down to eat, I took that opportunity to bring up the warning that my friend gave me the day before in his apartment. I told him everything that he said to me and how scared he looked when he said it and that I was feeling a little bit worried about going to this party. David cut me off before I even got to finish my sentence and firmly said we're going and then went on a rant about how my friend is a jealous cloud chaser and that he's just salty that his content isn't good enough and would never be invited to something like this. He said it in a half serious, half joking tone like he always does when he wants to get his way. Then he finished off by guilting me and saying, Doug, don't ruin this opportunity for us. Please just get through this party for me. I'd never heard anybody talk about my friend that way, but I'd known David for so much longer, so I trusted his judgment. So I nodded my head and called the Uber. We changed in the bathrooms and hopped into the Uber and David starts recording again. So I have to pretend to be excited again. But once we got off the side streets and started driving up Laurel Canyon, I started getting anxious and internally panicking. If you're not familiar with Laurel Canyon, it's filled with beautiful homes, but at night it's extremely dark and borderline freaky, especially when you consider all the history with the Manson murders in that area. Part of me feels like we're dropping ourselves off into a setup, but once we arrive, all of my worries get washed away. We pull into the driveway and this house is beautiful and extravagant. And everyone waiting in line to walk in is smiling and laughing and friendly. So I get excited again. At the door, they take our phones and have us sign an NDA, which isn't uncommon in house parties like this in LA. And they give us a mask and a name tag with funny aliases. My mask looked like a bear and David's looked like a bird. My alias was Stardust, which David got a crack out of. And his was Banshee. We enter what you could call like the lobby of the house. And as we're walking in, the apparent host of the party starts giving a speech. This man is very eccentric and outspoken. And he's got the cadence of a late night show host. And I spot the agent that invited us standing right behind him. The speech was basically just encouraging everybody to have fun and explaining the itinerary of the night. Apparently, this was a themed room party and all of the guests were instructed to move to the next room whenever the grandfather clock chimed. He wrapped up his speech with some cheeky joke and then one line that still irks me to this day. He said, have fun now. Our descent starts at midnight. The moment the host wrapped up his speech, a couple of workers came out of the doorway. They were holding a couple sets of long poles. All of a sudden, music started playing and everybody seemed like they knew what was going on. So I just went along with it. So I guess these parties start off with a big game of limbo. It's funny seeing people dressed so nicely playing a silly child's game, but it's even weirder seeing A-list celebrities being so excited to play because everybody had masks on, but when somebody that you grew up watching in movies walks by you with a quarter of their face covered, you still know it's them. I was amazed with how inviting and willing to introduce themselves these people were. I was expecting at least an undertone of uppityness in there, but it seemed like everybody was involving everybody in conversation and they were frequently introducing themselves to me with their alias, of course. The only thing weird about it was something that I didn't notice until the third person did it. When they shook my hand, they pressed their thumb into the soft part between my thumb and my pointer finger. And I only recognized the pattern because the third guy gave me a big smile and said, this must be your first time here. In retrospect, this should have alarmed me, but it seemed like they got friendlier when they realized that it was my first time here. So I didn't really think anything of it. But before I got to ask any follow-up questions about this odd handshake, the first grandfather clock chime went off and everybody excitedly rushed into the second room. When I finally got in there, I was taken aback by the dramatic decor change. Everything in this room was different shades of blue. The music was romantic and all the furniture was cabana beds and love seats. I stood there for a second trying to realize what was different, but I couldn't put my finger on it until some girl walked by and caressed my shoulder in a really flirty manner. The decor changed, but the way everybody was acting was drastically different. Before, everybody seemed to be outgoing and inviting and friendly, but the second they stepped foot into this room, they became touchy, flirty, and suggestive. I was only 19 at the time, so this type of behavior from people that I saw as adults made me extremely uncomfortable especially when I saw that the cabana beds had curtains that you could close for privacy. And I realized that these people weren't just being suggestive, they meant it. I tried to give David the eyes that I didn't like where this party was going, but he seemed to be really enjoying the female attention, so I was on my own. I basically stayed in perpetual motion and walked laps until the next chime went off, so I didn't have to sit next to anybody for too long and let them get too comfortable. The clock finally went off and everybody rushed to the next room immediately. The weirdest part was the people that were in the private sections didn't even bother redressing except for the mask. I was in no rush 
rush to get to the next room, but I could see into it over the crowd of everybody's head. The walls were bright orange, but the smells that were wafting in from that room were amazing. And when I finally got in there, it was like the Hogwarts feast. It was table after table of the most delicious spreads I've ever seen. There was full tables for seafood, full tables for meats, full tables of sushi, and an entire wall of spirits. I almost started enjoying myself again. Until I saw the way these people were treating this food. They were disrespectfully biting chunks out of delicious prime rib roasts. They were just shoving copious amounts of high-grade sashimi into their mouths and eating caviar like it was cereal. The way that they were just grabbing with their hands and just spitting out things that they didn't like onto the floor ruined my appetite. At this point, I wanted nothing to do with these people. So I went up to the only familiar face in the room. The agent that invited me was the only other person not eating. So I approached him and lifted up my mask so he'd recognize me considering we'd only met one time. Before I even got out my greeting or got my mask halfway off my face, he abruptly pressed my mask back into place and sharply said, mask stay on till the sixth room. He did it in a way that seemed like I was embarrassing him for not knowing the rules. So to ease the tension, I jokingly replied, so we're only halfway there, huh? He didn't laugh or make eye contact. He just dismissively replied, I encourage you to engage in the festivities. A slow drip is better than a flood. He started to walk towards the door as the clock chimed for the next room like he knew it was about to go off. I didn't like that interaction at all. He's the one that invited me here and he seemed to have no interest in talking to me. I just kept going over what he said the entire time while we were in the next room. This room was yellow and basically just a casino. I wanted to talk to David privately and let him know that I wanted to leave, but he seemed to just be caught up in the momentum of the party. Plus there was a roulette table in the room and David's freakishly good at roulette. So at this point, the winning streak that he's building is the center point of the party. I can't fully focus on what the agent said to me because I have to pretend to be excited about David's winning streak in a fake casino where you're not actually winning money. And like clockwork, the chime goes off. The entire party starts rushing to the next room again and the vibe changes dramatically. I'm the last person to walk into the bright red room. This room didn't seem to have a specific activity like the others. It was just empty and bright red and everybody was whispering to each other. For a split second, I thought it might be a big game of telephone or something silly like that. But as I started walking through and brushing shoulders with these people and hearing what they were saying to each other, I started questioning everything. The same people that I saw laughing and celebrating and eating together were whispering the most heinous, offensive comments directly to each other. I mean things that you wouldn't even say behind your friend's back, they were saying it to their face. I'm talking friendship ending secrets and personal opinions about each other laced with envy and jealousy. I hurried to a quiet corner because I was sick of hearing everybody's dirty laundry after walking around for a minute and a half. And it all clicked. I knew exactly exactly what this party was. I see the host ask the first person in line a question before having them repeat something that he said. When I tell you I am done with this party, I'm absolutely not doing that. All the dots start connecting in my head while everybody's being horrible to each other around me. I'm trying to recap the whole night and remember the order of each room to solidify my suspicions, but the chime for the next room goes off. This time, everybody gets eerily quiet and calm like they got all of their venom out. The host of the party announces for all of the newcomers to come to the front. All of the attendees these form a single file line in front of the next room's door. There's about 10 other newcomers in front of me and David, and the agent that invited us is standing to the left of the door, and the host of the party is standing to the right. The host has a pile of books on the table next to him. I see the host ask the first person in line a question, and then grab a book based on his answer. He would present the book to the person, and place a diamond-shaped metal symbol on top of it, before having them repeat something that he said. Then he'd take their mask off and let them enter the next room. I couldn't make out exactly what he was doing until there was only two people ahead of me in line. The books were Bibles, Korans, Torahs, and so on. He would ask the person, and which one is yours? Whichever they chose, he'd grab it and place the metal symbol on top of it. He'd have you put your hand on top of the metal symbol and then repeat, I am my own God. I bow to nobody but myself. When I tell you I am done with this party and I whip my head around and I tell David, I am absolutely not doing that. David whispered back in a joking tone like he always does. Dude, it's just a party. Who cares? I'll see you in the next room. And he skipped me in line to show me that he'd do it first to make me feel more comfortable. He went through with it and giggled his way into the next room. It was my turn, so I tried to play it cool and whisper to the host, do you mind if I skip this part? It's making me a little bit uncomfortable. I thought he'd subtly break character and reassure me that this is just a party theme and it's all good. Instead, he whispered back to me in a really kind tone. Of course, man, don't worry about it. Just take your mask off and turn around. I was relieved for about a split second before the agent that invited me here grabbed my arm and started guiding me towards the exit. And I see that everybody that was behind me in line staring at me straight faced. I look back at the host and he's standing up and loudly shouts like he's starting a chant. The price was not paid. And then everybody in line that was staring at me chants in unison like they knew exactly what to do. Remove the profanity 
faint, and they repeat it over and over until I'm through the exit door. The price was not paid, remove the profane. The price was not paid, remove the profane. So the agent just walks me to the closest door. He doesn't even walk me to the front of the party and out the front door. He just puts me out into the backyard. It's 4 a.m. My friend's still inside. I don't have my phone. So I decide to walk around the right side of the house because that's where all of the party attendees were kind of headed. Let me see if I could peek in and maybe flag down David to let him know I got kicked out. And there's some windows to the next room. But of course, these windows are like big church stained glass windows. And you can't really see through stained glass windows like the colored ones. But if you go really, really close and you look through the white parts, you could kind of see clearly what is on the inside. And this room is like a bizarre church replica without all of the seating. It's just a big church-like room. And all of the people that were in there had their masks off. And it was like a big circle and almost looked like an initiation. And all of these celebrities are standing around in a circle around the other nine new people. It was 10 excluding me. And there was big TV grade cameras recording and it looked like the group of celebrities and everybody else that was there was kind of cheering them on but then there was clearly people in there that were much more serious and kind of threatening and the 10 new people were in the middle of this room being forced to do horrible things things that I wish I could unsee and the new people clearly didn't want to do these things. They were being forced to do these things. And they were clearly recording it. And I see my friend being forced to do these horrible things in front of these people and in front of these cameras. I just start panicking. I don't know what to do. It's so in my head, I'm like, I just need to get out of here. So I start speed walking to the front of the house. And I'm, I'm thinking I need to get out of this gate. There's only one street. We're on Laurel Canyon. So it's either I go left and start running towards Studio City or I go right and start running towards West Hollywood. I'm not, I'm not about to go knock on other people's doors. I'm just trying to get back to civilization. And I'm trying to remember if we're closer to Studio City or if we're closer to West Hollywood. I, I don't even know. As I get to the front of the house, one of the employees is standing there and he's standing in front of a car and he has my phone. I'm not sure if he knows that I just saw everything. So I'm kind of standing there deer in headlights, but he just politely goes, here's your phone and here's your ride. Don't worry. The driver will take you home. So I take my phone and I sit in the car and I'm trying to gauge to see if this driver has any malicious intent, but he doesn't seem to. And within the first three minutes, I, I know that they don't think I saw anything. They were just getting my stuff prepared and my car prepared to take me home because they're under the impression that I didn't see anything too bad and I got kicked out before any horrible things started happening to people inside of this party. So I get in the car and I'm checking my phone and my phone was fully charged when I got here so I, I don't know what they did but my phone won't turn on. I have to sit through this 30 minute car ride. One of my best friends is back at this party getting mistreated and recorded doing horrible things and I can't tell anybody. So I get through this 30 minute horrible suspense filled car ride thinking about all of the people that were so nice to me inside of this party and the whole intent of this party was to butter me up to get me to do these horrible things. And when I finally get back to my apartment, I run upstairs, I plug my phone into the charger, and the first texts that come through are from my friend Joe. And I completely forgot that my friend Joe was coming to visit me. He was coming on a little mini vacation and I was gonna play tour guide and show him around the city. So now I'm thinking, I only have like four and a half hours to sleep before I have to go pick up my friend from the airport. And I still don't know if my other friend is okay. So I'm blowing up David's phone because he's still at this party, but I set a timer so I get to the airport to pick up my other friend. So I barely get any sleep. I drive to LAX to go pick up Joe and I drive him back to my apartment. And when I'm coming back into my apartment, David's in the lobby and he's talking to some other big creators, like bouncing video ideas. It's like 9 30, 10 a.m. at this point. So everybody's just kind of having coffee by the cafe and chatting. I tell Joe to go upstairs to my apartment and drop off his luggage. And I go ask David if I could talk to him really quick. I'm clearly very distressed and he's being very jokey with me. And he doesn't seem like anything bad happened. And he's just kind of making fun of me for getting kicked out of the party. I'm just letting him talk for a little bit. And I finally tell him I was looking in through the next window. I I saw what they made him do and I was just asking him if he's okay and the second I said that he immediately switched on me and he started damn near cussing me out and saying friendship ending things and his eyes turned from happy and giddy to filled with almost fear and a little bit of betrayal when he stormed off he pulled out his phone and he was calling somebody as if he was like reporting something back to them I immediately start freaking out I assume that he's telling them that I saw what they did and now I have my friend upstairs who thinks he's just on vacation when I just saw hyper successful rich people People doing unspeakable acts and they have all of the resources to come after me. They know where I live and David isn't even on my side because the dirt that they have on him now. I have to pretend that everything's okay to Joe because he flew all the way out here for a vacation and I don't even really know how bad the situation is. I don't even know how to tell him about everything that happened the night before. And I promised Joe that we we're going to go to Runyon Canyon this morning. So he goes and changes into hiking gear and I drive him over to Runyon Canyon. We do the hike for a few hours and when we come back and I check my mail, there's another letter from these people and I take it to the bathroom 
bathroom because I don't even want Joe to see it. And it's a screenshot of the surveillance footage of me looking in through the window and a little handwritten note, just a reminder of the worst mistake you've ever made. Curiosity killed the cat. And I start freaking out. I know that David just betrayed me and told them that I saw, and now they have proof that I saw. Now I'm just a walking liability to them. And now they're threatening me and that that was the worst mistake that I've ever made and insinuating that curiosity killed the cat. I'm the cat, but it's still not enough to tell Joe about what happened. So I just go on with the charade and I'm just playing tourist, bringing my friend around the city. And the first day, nothing happened. And to this day, I firmly believe that the only reason they didn't do anything to me is because Joe was there with me that whole week and he had just finished the police academy. And he was officially a police officer. So I think me being with him is the only thing that kept me safe because they weren't willing to do anything to a police officer. And I knew for sure they were keeping an eye on me the next day because Joe asked me the night before if I had half and half for our coffees the next morning. And I didn't have any half and half. And he just jokingly said, who has coffee and doesn't have half and half? It was a conversation in passing. It was a joke. And the next morning we woke up and there was a full half and half in my fridge. And the only reason I noticed that is because Joe said, thanks for running out early and grabbing half and half. You didn't have to do that. I was kidding. I didn't go and grab that half and half. I knew that somebody was not only listening, but entered my apartment that night while we were asleep. And then they started to do these things that only I would notice. Things that if you told anybody, they would look at you like you were crazy. Each night that we came home and we were just winding down and watching TV, I would go to turn my TV on and the remote control wouldn't work. And I would check the batteries and the batteries would be switched from positive to negative and negative to positive. Like they came into my house and just flipped my batteries. I know that my remote control worked the day before and they just needed me to know that they were in my house and flipped my batteries just to let me know that they were invading my privacy on a daily basis. And then it started escalating to when I would take Joe to lunch or we would pop to the grocery store or we would go to the movies and we would come back to the car and my left blinker would be on. They would just open my car and put it down and every time we would come back to the car, my left turning signal would be on. It happened like six times. How can I tell anybody that somebody broke into my car and turned my left signal down? It's something that only I would notice and I can't tell Joe because I'm not trying to scare him and it's also something that I don't even think he would take seriously. He would probably say, you probably hit it down when you were stepping out of the car and then things started to pick up. They started to do very specific things to me that weren't just by chance. We came home one day and I locked the door behind me like I was doing every time because I was super, super paranoid. My apartment door lock just locked swiftly. My apartment door lock doesn't lock swiftly. I would have to like press into it and jiggle it and force it to lock. And it's been like that since I moved in. And it had this sharp little nub on the front that I would feel with my thumb every single day. And one of the days we came home and it just smoothly locked and the nub wasn't there. So they were letting me know that I can't even lock them out out. But how do I tell anybody that they're doing this to me? Because they would just say the apartment was probably aware of it and changed it. And I still wasn't able to tell Joe because I would think that he would come to the same conclusion. But then the next day we go to the car to go to breakfast and we get into my old car that I've had for five or six years at the time. And I grab my gear shifter and I go to pull it into reverse and it smoothly goes from park to reverse. And my gear shifter doesn't smoothly go from park to reverse. You have to wiggle it in a certain way. You have to press the button with your thumb in a certain way to get it into reverse. I only know this because I drove this car every single day for five years and this gear shifter is pretty much broken. It's an old car. And that morning I got into my car and it smoothly went from park to reverse and the wooden finish on the gear shifter was different. Mine had scratches on it and this one was brand new. So they were telling me not only are they able to just break into my car and turn the left signal down, they're also willing to manipulate my car. Now I know for sure Joe isn't safe either and me not telling him these things puts him into danger because I'm driving him around in this car. And if they could change my gear shifter, why wouldn't they be able to cut my brakes? So I basically just break down and I have to tell Joe everything from start to finish about this weird party with this weird agent and the little things that I've been noticing all week and that this was the last straw. And Joe believed me because we used to drive around in my car together all of the time. And sometimes he would drive my car and he made me promise that I did not get that fixed. The gear shifter was still broken yesterday and it's fixed today and I didn't do that. So that won him over and he basically said, we need to get out of here. It shook him too. He didn't like the idea of these people in the house. When I told him I didn't get the half and half, when I told him all of these things that were adding up over the last couple days, it freaked him out. And he's like, bro, we got to go back to your apartment. We got to get your stuff. We got to get you out of here. Then my entire world is shattering. I moved out here and all of these things were going great for me. And I had a place and I had friends and I didn't want to leave. Maybe the stuff will die out. I'll be able to work with other people. It's going to be okay. I don't want to just leave my apartment, leave all my stuff. But Joe insisted that we went back to my apartment to grab his stuff in mine and then go stay at a motel before he leaves the next day. And when we got to my apartment, David was in the lobby with other creators by the cafe again. And I went up to him. I didn't really have any idea about what I was going to say to him. All he did was hand me a coffee, ignore everything that
that I said and walk away. But then when I looked at the coffee, it had a little napkin wrapped around it. I saw that something was written in Sharpie on the napkin. It said, I'm so sorry. You have to leave tomorrow with him. Otherwise it's me and you. And I went upstairs and I packed a couple backpacks and I left LA the next morning with my friend and I never went back. Joe and I rushed out of that city as fast as we could. I packed as much of my stuff as I could and, I, and we just started driving. We were both genuinely scared for our safety at that point. So we decided to skip Joe's scheduled flight and just drive to Las Vegas. And then we were just gonna fly home from there. There was something that just felt comforting about being out of the state. Not to mention Joe wanted a real briefing about what went down. Cause I had just basically told him the cliff notes and begged him to believe me so that we could pick up and leave as soon as possible. For the first two hours of the drive, we primarily kept our heads on a swivel and just made sure that we didn't take any wrong turns to further extend this trip. There were a few cars that made me feel like we were being followed, but it was just my paranoia enhancing an A-type personality driver into a stalker. Once we were out of California state lines and into Nevada, we could both finally exit. I felt real relief wash over me for the first time since I got kicked out of that party. We stopped about 15 minutes into Nevada at a pit stop. We used their Wi-Fi to book a hotel for Vegas that night, along with the plane tickets for the next morning. Once we had our escape plan fully booked, Joe just started laughing and I couldn't help but just start laughing too. We shared a lot of crazy stories growing up and we always seemed to find ourselves in sticky situations together. So it was just hilarious that his fun trip to visit me turned into this. It felt really good to laugh about it because it made me feel like it was finally over. We got back into the car to continue our drive and Joe playfully said, so you have one hour to explain to me why we're fleeing Los Angeles over some half and half and a gear shifter before we get to Vegas and we make this trip worth it. I realized how bizarre this whole situation must have looked from his perspective. He flew in for a fun vacation and arrived to see his friend in a crisis. As I started to explain to him the series of events, things really started to click for me, especially with his input as a police officer. I'm going to recap some of the events that I had already explained, but with the conclusions that we came to together. Clearly, the man that invited us to the party was a predator, and we were just perfect targets for him. We were young kids with enough of a following on socials to influence all of the other young creators in the area. We had just made a major change in our life by moving across the country, and we were completely isolated from our families who we could consult with about important decision making. And we were in a bad financial situation because at the time, just having a following on the internet didn't equal revenue. We were perfect targets to be indoctrined into a system where they could have full control over our budding careers. And apparently that's exactly what cult-like communities look for for potential members. Not to mention, we were in LA trying to make a career in entertainment and it seemed like they held the key to our dreams. As I was explaining to Joe the invitation and how it showed up to my house, we came to the conclusion that this guy approaching us at that party was not a coincidence. He had to have been scouting us prior to the time that I thought that we just met by chance. The party itself was a trap as well. When I finally had the chance to process what he said to me about the slow drip is better than a flood, it really started to make sense. Each room was designed to slowly introduce you into giving into temptation and sin. Everybody there being so nice and inviting was clearly on purpose. Seeing all of these people that you've looked up to for years indulging in these temptations of each room and inviting you to join in with them is perfect peer pressure. You don't want to let your idols down, so you voluntarily engage in an activity in each room that just gets progressively worse and worse. And of course, they start with flirtiness and overeating delicious food. And of course, spirits, because those things are so easy to give into. But the temptations of the night keep getting worse as you go on. He wanted me to feel the slow drip, so when it was time to commit the heinous acts of the sixth room, it didn't feel like a flood. It's clear why they kicked me out when they did. I wasn't indulging the way everybody else had. And when it came to the time to defame my religion, it was the last straw. Most people, like myself, would think it was just part of the party theme. But to them, it's the test to see if you're broken down enough to defame your religion for the fun of the party. That's why the sixth room was the flood. It was dramatically worse than the rooms that I had experienced. And the only way somebody would give in to the peer pressure to do what they were doing in that room is them being primed to do so with everything that happened before and had just spoken the words that they're not God fear. I realized that the people that would go to that party didn't just blow up overnight because of the power of that little cultish group. They scouted young creators like myself and David, who they believed were going to blow up regardless of their help and get them to commit heinous acts on camera. So when they did eventually blow up, they had the perfect blackmail on them to control them. They would try to get to you early so before you were making money independently so that they could control you. Because if you were already established and wealthy, why would you even care about going to a party like this? You just don't care. It's too late for them to infiltrate your life. Do they help you with big collaborations? Yeah. But these collaborations are built off of fear and trauma. That's how they keep their group so tight. You can't get into this group unless you also do these horrible things. They kicked me out and let me leave because they thought I actually didn't see anything too bad. From the outside perspective, I had just gone to a cool A-list party in a beautiful home filled with beautiful people and amazing food. I couldn't say anything bad about it publicly without sounding bitter that I got kicked 
out. That's how groups like this need to operate. From the outside looking in, it has to look amazing and wonderful to be a part of. From the inside, they need blackmail that's so bad on you that you can never speak out against it without getting your reputation destroyed. It made sense why they went after me the way they did. They need to do things to me that only I would notice because they couldn't be seen openly harassing. It would make them look bad. So they had to infiltrate my privacy and scare me secretly. I still don't know how far they would have gone to get me to leave the city. If they would get violent or try to get me to fall victim to an accident. But they wanted to scare me out of the city. And I thought back to my very kind friend that warned me about this part and how secretive he was being about how much he knew about it. He couldn't just openly say how weird those people were because it would make him a target. He just knew that if he kindly declined their offers and acted like he knew nothing about them, he could go about pursuing his career unbothered. And it really made sense why they would target potential big creators as well. Because if the kid with the most clout is a part of this group and the only way to collaborate with him was to go through the same indoctrination, they would be able to control an entire generation of creators. To be honest, they're very good at what they do. There was a clear system that they followed and the way that they approached harassing me out of the city. It was done at a professional level. Joe told me that it's called gang stalking and that most of the time it actually isn't happening. And what I mean by that is most of the time that somebody reports that a crime like this is being committed, it's actually a paranoid schizophrenic having an episode. So they harass you in a way that even the police department would consider it a mental disorder opposed to gang stalking. Everything about the way these people operate is cult-like and everything that they do is intentional. I was never even a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but my perspective on show business in Hollywood completely changed on the way to Vegas. All the dots connected and I saw how truly evil some people in that industry actually are. And when I got to Vegas, I started to see how openly they show it. I know I've spent this whole time talking about how secret and exclusive this party was and how everybody that knows about it has their lips zipped shut, but when we had arrived at our hotel near the strip, I started looking around at the big signs and promotions and they really don't hide it. There was cultish symbolism in all of the music, live performances and movie trailers. What used to look like just cool designs and eccentric artists was blatant symbolism for what was actually going on. I will never look at showbiz the same after that. I'm extremely happy being an independent artist, safe in the middle of the country away from those cultish hedonists. I never received another letter or heard from David again, but what I can tell you is that everybody that was affiliated with that group became massively famous, but everybody involved fell as hard as they ascended and have had even more massive controversies. And to anybody pursuing a life in the arts or social media, do not fall into this trap. They will promise you everything that you've ever wanted, but they'll take it away whenever they please. And I promise you will hurt the people around you in the process. Welcome to the society.